We begin our message with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, the, the blessing of gathering around your word, hearing it and learning from it, and seeing uh, more about who you are and the continual newness that you show to us day after day um, by revealing yourself to us and your plans and promises to us in your word. And as we go there today, fill us with your spirit. Um, show us the, the power that you have um, every single day in our lives that we might um, fill those lives with real praise and thanks continually for you and um, that we might shine you to others. We ask this all in the name of our living and reigning Savior Jesus. Amen. Do you have a place that you love? Do you have a person that you love? If you, if you do, I, I would imagine that there is sort of a connected reason or a similar um, attribute behind both of those types of love for either a place or a person. And maybe part of it is because it's a place that you frequent often or maybe even daily. Or if it's a person, say spouse or family, it's because you, you speak to them or see them often or daily. And yet despite the familiarity that you might have with a, a place or a person, there's this newness that's always there. There are different situations, memories, events, sadnesses, joys. There are reasons upon reasons that you, you love those people or those places. There's always something a little different going on. And obviously, a, a great way, especially to get to know a person, is to spend time with them, to see all the things that makes that person unique, to understand how they react in, in different situations, how they face challenges and frustrations, how they hold up under pressure, how they respond to ad adversity, to see if, if there's joy that they carry constantly, even through the difficult times, or if they are more of a yo-yo, where it's kind of situationally up and down, how their emotions rise and fall with the day. And all of these things help to build a relationship that's founded on something real, founded on a history with that person. It is not just founded on something that's only advantageous for me. And that's important for us as people because those people or those places or especially people that we love do not stay the same. They don't stay frozen in time. Change comes and it changes the way that we're going to look at and, and see places and people. But those past memories certainly do help to hold on to why we love that person. But this is all nothing really new. Nothing spectacular, groundbreaking. In fact, you probably know all of that already. Maybe even can articulate it better than me. But God works differently. Today we continue our series in getting to know our God, getting to know our Jesus. And as we do and continue to look at him through his word, we see he desires a relationship with him, with, with us. But we also see it's different than all other relationships that we might have. 
It's not one that dwells on the past, even though there would be plenty for us to look at there, to focus on there, even though our God could rest on all that he has done. He does not. Instead, he continues to gift us with his newness. He continues to give us new reasons each and every single day that continue to shadow the things that he has done in the past. History is extremely important. But today, God encourages us not to look at the things in the past, but to look at the present and to have confidence in the future because he has some wonderful plans for you and me. And we hear him say this as we listen to him speaking through his word once more. From Isaiah 43. Do not remember the former things. Do not keep thinking about ancient things. Watch, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it will spring up. Don't you know about it? Indeed, I will make a road in the wilderness. In the wasteland, I will make rivers. The wild animals, the jackals and ostriches will honor me because I am providing water in the wilderness, rivers in a parched wasteland, water for my chosen people to drink. This people that I formed for myself will declare my praise. But you have not called on me, O Jacob. Instead, you have become weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep as your whole burnt offerings. You did not glorify me with your sacrifices. I did not make you serve me with a grain offering. I did not make you weary with demands for incense. You did not purchase fragrant cane for me with silver or satisfy me with the fat from your sacrifices. Instead, you have made me serve because of your sins. You have made me weary because of your guilt. I, yes, I am he. I blot out your rebellious deeds for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. I'm about to say something that is very unlike me. And and in fact, if understood improperly, could potentially be a damaging thing for me to say. And I preface it with this because I really would ask and encourage you to listen carefully to the explanation of it. So are you ready? Here it goes. It is a damaging and even a dangerous thing to live in the past. It is a very bad idea to believe that your greatest times are behind you and the future is bleak. Now, I would imagine that probably initially, many of us, if not just outright rejecting that statement, would at the very least question it. After all, I, like you, especially when it comes to to worship, remember a time in the not-so-distant past when our worship was a lot more responsive among the entire congregation, when we sang more songs, when we got together more, when there was more fellowship opportunities, when we could enter a building and didn't have to wonder if we had our mask with us or if it was staying up the whole time. And life was just simpler. But hear me out. And far more importantly than that, hear God out. Hear God out and and keep in mind who this is who's, who's speaking to us this message. This is the same God who instituted the Passover for the Israelites as a continual remembrance of his deliverance 
for them out of the hand of the Egyptians, lest they forget all that he had done. Here God, out, and keep in mind, this is the same God who also says just a few chapters later in Isaiah 46, remember this and stand firm. Remember the former things from old. This is the same God who says in Deuteronomy not to forget to teach and instruct their children about the Passover narrative, the Exodus narrative, so that their children would not forget. The same God who says in Numbers how he tells them to even make fringes on their clothing so they don't forget God's word. In fact, this is the same God who throughout the Old Testament over and over again is all about remembering the former things. And it, and it really begs the question, well, why now is God saying to forget about them? And in short, the reason is this. Israel's faith had sort of eroded into nostalgia. You could say it had degraded to a form of belief that God was at one time great, yes, and did great things, and certainly they would praise him for that. But his best days were behind him. He was not going to be doing much of anything spectacular now. They had lifted the things God had done in the past up so much that now they sort of had blinders on as to what God was currently doing. And they were even limited in thinking what God could do in the future. And it's in this sense that, yes, the former days can instruct, but they can also turn someone into a, into a slave. That remembrance, yes, can give hope, but it can also replace it with the thought that our best days are behind us. And therefore, God commands his people, do not remember the former things. He wanted them to know who he was. He wanted them to get to know him better. Because there's no other deity who's like him. No other deity can renew anything. They're locked into continuous cycles, or they're only as good as what you do on their behalf. They're locked in with the seasons and can at best only do what they have previously done. But when the one true God who liberated Israel from Egypt, when he did that, by no means did he exhaust all his resources. And so he gives them encouragement here as well. Watch. I'm about to do a new thing. But the Israelites were struggling with that because of where they currently were. But if you remember in the Exodus, there was a time shortly after they had left Egypt, after that, that final plague where they had been given all this gold from the Egyptians and sent on their way and told to leave, that Pharaoh kind of came to his senses and thought, oh, there goes all my free labor. So he gathers his army to go chasing after them to bring them back by force. And as the Israelites had left, they now hear the, the thunderous sound of hooves and chariots screaming across the landscape. And fear rises up inside of them. And then, to make matters worse, in front of them, they are blocked by this wall of water, a great sea. They're trapped. They feel abandoned. They felt deserted as if God did all these things, but now he's just going to let them be conquered once more. And soon after that, we know he delivered on his promise. He brought them safely through on dry, dry ground. And now he tells his people to trust him once more. 
In that first exodus, God created dry land in the middle of water. And now God says he is going to create water in the midst of dry land because what his people now need to cross is a desert. And this idea of abandonment is what God is going to take on. And we see that abandonment that leads to salvation climactically occur in the events of Good Friday to Easter. God truly had something marvelous and wonderful planned for his people. Something that did everything they did not. Something that made God, the God of all, servant to those who would not serve him. Something that transformed a rebellious people into the people of his righteousness, blotted out their sins, and restored a broken relationship. And you and I, we have the same God. We have a God who could very well say the exact same thing to us as he could have said to the Israelites of old. Look at everything I've done for you. I've given you all the signs and wonders that I performed and acted out in the past. I kept my promise of salvation. I sent my son, my only son, into the world and I poured him out, body and soul, as an offering for all of your sins. Your sins have been paid for. And they'll be remembered no more. And then... I burst through the chains of death, conquering it, and I made that victory yours and well. What more can I possibly do for you? He could ask, and it would be an appropriate question. And yet, despite all of that he has done, we grow tired from the blessings of a thousand yesterdays. We come to God's house expecting God to serve me. God to give me something and not to give ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. We fill ourselves with ingratitude and empty worship and it and have become experts at going through the motions. And then we can complain as we look around and it feels like we have also been abandoned and placed in the desert as well. We can feel similarly that God is just a God of the past. That yeah, he's done some great things, but maybe his best days are behind him. And we sort of got the short end of the deal. And so we have to live in the past and just hold on to all those things that he has done. Hold on to the memory of his former greatness. And we'll worship him for that. But in his grace, and that's truly the only way we can even possibly begin to describe it, his undeserved love, God comes to us and tells us the same thing. No. Just you watch. He answers our questioning of what have you done for me with forget if you must. I am still doing something and it's going to be spectacular. Just you watch. I'm about to do something new. I'm going to shine through you and continue to make you new and renew your spirit. I'm going to continue to guide you through the desert of this sinful world and I'm going to make all things new once more. I'm going to return the greatest spectacle that any eye will ever see and bring you home, resurrect you from the grave. But for now, I'm going to use my perfect knowledge and my perfect power to make sure that you know that I am for you. I will bend and use everything, every stage of life, every circumstance, every situation, all that is and all that will be, even those situations that you see as bad or proof that I am not in control, I will use everything 
to accomplish my saving purpose. I will show myself new in every circumstance as your God and Savior. And I pray that this continual action from our God would lead us to gasp in awe and wonder at the depth of his love, at its newness, how it continues on and on, and how he desires to be shown and seen as constantly for us. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.